Good morning, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Gabrowski, and I'll be your host for today. We are getting close to the end of January. It's been an awesome start to 2022. Um, We've hosted almost 30 live events, and we still have a whole lineup of events coming up on Monday to wrap things up. If you do want to check those out, you can head over to exploringbytheseat.com and find all the events uh, coming up for January. And we've also just announced about 40 events for February. February is also a great month. We kick all the men out in February and we host women in science, exploration, conservation, uh, and adventure all month long. So do check out all those events and grab your camera spots or register to tune in live via YouTube as well. So we have a great event today. We are heading over to the United Kingdom. We're going to spend a little time with Richard Walker. So uh, Richard teaches scuba diving using the Global Underwater Explorers curriculum. It focuses on creating the next generation of exploration and conservation scuba divers. Richard also manages the UK charity Ghost Fishing UK. It's a group of volunteer divers that find and remove deadly ghost fishing gear from the seas around the United Kingdom. So I'm going to bring Richard in live with us right now. Hey, Richard, how are you doing today? Hi, Joe. I'm good. How are you? Good, good. It's great to see you. Uh, today it's been a while. I think we were just discussing before. It's been about two years since our last connection, but uh, who knows these days? Two years disappear so quickly. It has. It's been. It, it seems like just a week or two ago, but yeah, you're right. It's, it's two years now. All it's right. Been, well, so. we're we're excited to dive a little bit deeper into the work that you're doing. Uh, it's incredibly important work. It's taking you to some amazing wrecks uh around the coast of the united kingdom so i'm gonna let you take over for a little bit and then we'll let the classrooms fire away with some question and answer action all right awesome thanks joe thanks everyone for coming um i know it's early where you guys are uh here in the uk it's just gone two o'clock in the afternoon so i've had my lunch and um i'm kind of set for the day really so let me share my screen and i can press on So there we go. So that's me. Uh, that's me, Rich Walker, and I'm the chairman of Ghost Fishing UK. Now, what I'm going to try and do in this talk is to tell you a little bit about what's beneath the surface of the sea around the UK. And then I'm going to transition into um, what we do at Ghost Fishing UK and why I think it's so important to the health of the seas, not only around the UK, but around the world as well. So let's press on with this. So you can see the UK here. Um, so there's a map, there's a globe, there's the Atlantic Ocean, and the UK is right here on the eastern side of the Atlantic. And this is the United Kingdom here, and you have the rest of Europe over here, Scandinavia up here. And we sit out on the continental, just on the edge of the continental shelf here. Now, I grew up here in London, and but now I've since moved down here to a, a place in the southwest called Somerset. And that gives me access to the English Channel to um, down into Cornwall. Um, it's a little bit further from the north of England, but it's nice here. But this is basically um, a little bit about me and where I live. Now, if you look at the kind of diving that you can do around the UK, basically we're an island. So we have a coastline all the way around us and we have a huge maritime history as well. It was basically our trading for thousands of years has happened by sea. So we have, as a result of that, hundreds and thousands of shipwrecks all around our coastline. And there's pretty much no area of water that we don't dive in, uh, from the north of Scotland right down to the tip of Cornwall. Everywhere is, a, is some kind of reason to go scuba diving. We're also a nation that, that um, kind of relies on the fishing industry as well. You know, we all like to eat fish. I do anyway. And what that means is we have a, a very significant fishery all around the coast of the UK, be it for uh, things like crabs, crustaceans, shellfish, right through to to um, the bigger stuff like mackerel, cod and and all kinds of fish, basically. But we're a we're a, a country that likes to eat fish. We like our fish. So that means we have a fishing industry as well. And these things are going to kind of join up for us in this talk. So that's me. After coming out from a dive, that's probably up in Scotland somewhere in the Orkney Islands. 
um, diving on some wrecks up there. And this is what you can see around the coasts of the UK. And this one again is up in Scapa Flow. This is a wreck of a, of a German warship that sank in 1919 when it was scuttled after the Germans handed over their navy to the to the uh, the British Navy. Um, but all around our coastline, as I say, is full of full of shipwrecks. And you see these shipwrecks are not just ships. They're also havens for marine life as well. You can see all the fish and the the static life, life of the anemones and the urchins and, and everything. And it's not uncommon to see bigger animals here around the UK as well. So seals, dolphin, whale are all things that you can see around our coastline if you're lucky on a, on a scuba dive. But it's not just wreck diving that you can do. Um, we have some of the most beautiful reefs. They're not coral reefs in a, in a kind of Caribbean tropical kind of environment. But these beautiful cold water reefs where we have kelp forests, we have sponges, soft corals, um, urchins, you can see there in the picture. And all these things make it actually a pretty spectacular place to scuba dive. And also it makes it a very healthy environment to, for fish and marine life to grow in as well, which ultimately leads to a collision between the fishing industry and marine life. And you can see a, a fairly common sight. Now I learned to dive many years ago, 30 years ago now. And I can remember on every dive that I've pretty much ever done around the coast of the UK, seeing some kind of evidence of fishing gear that gets lost by, by fishermen when they're out on their, in their day-to-day -day lives. So, and you can see the effects of that very clearly here. So we've got a couple of crabs here that have got tangled up in a, in a lost fishing net. Now, one of the things we're always keen to do is to not point the finger of blame. We don't want to say to the fishermen, you're bad people for losing this net, or you're careless, or you're damaging the environment. What we want to understand here, or want you guys to understand, is that fishing gear gets lost accidentally. If any of you ever been fishing, then you'll know that you lose weights and hooks and line and stuff like that. It's nothing you're doing deliberately. It's just an accident. And when you're out there fishing every day, accidents happen and fishing gear does get lost. But the problem with fishing gear when it gets lost is it doesn't know it's lost. And it continues to do the job that it does. And that is to catch marine animals. It catches crabs, it catches fish. And then if it's out there for a longer term, it can go on to catch um, bigger animals like seals, dolphin and whale. And ultimately these animals then become they die in that net. They become bait for other animals and more and more animals become entangled in that net. Now, eventually it does kind of reach the bottom and it stabilizes itself. But the the damage that it causes in that process is kind of unknown, really. And it's huge. The the secondary problem it, with fishing net is most of it these days is made from some kind of plastic. And over the years, this plastic breaks down, it breaks into small pieces and it ends up as microplastics. And if you've seen any other kind of talks about microplastics and its effect on the environment, basically, this is a huge problem for us in the future. These tiny pieces of plastic can now be detected in just about all sediments in the seabed, on the seabed. They can be detected in animals that get that get caught. So if you catch a fish and you you kind of look inside it, you'll find microplastics in its digestive tract. So and who knows the effect that these plastics will have on the animals and on us ultimately who who eat those those fish. So ghost fishing is what, what this is called. Lost fishing gear that carries on catching animals has a huge potential problem. Um, and Basically, what we do at Ghost Fishing UK is to try and fix this problem, certainly around the coast of the UK. And this is what we're really talking about here. Plastic fishing nets um, that's on the key side there. So that's an that's, that's a everyday usable net. And if that gets lost, it's going to go on. It's going to catch hundreds, thousands of marine animals. And in the long term, it will break down into microplastics, which end up in our food chain. So that's a statement of the problem, if you like, of, of what what the problem is. And we set up Ghost Fishing UK in 2015. And our overall goal is to quantify, to measure how much of a problem it is around the coast of the UK. So survey fishing nets, find out how much fishing net is out there. 
and then to remove it back to the surface again and try and recycle it and get it turned into something useful again so it kind of either gets a new lease of life or or we can turn it into a brand new product and that's what ghost fishing uk does now we are a team of divers and i, I just counted up the members that we had we have now we've got 62 scuba divers that we've we've trained and a part of our core team we have a bunch of other people as well that do amazing work like our social media and they do our they take on administrative roles secretarial roles um organizing equipment managing the training and that kind of thing but we've got 62 scuba divers up and down the coast of the united kingdom and you can see a group of them there getting ready to go out on a dive now what we do when we get into the water basically it's always broken into two parts any project we do is a two-part project and the first thing that we do first thing we always do is to make a survey of a dive site so we want to find out what kind of fishing gear has been lost so you can see this is a chap called jason and he's swimming through a kind of an old um, submarine defense structure you can see the beams up behind him there and he's swimming through that and he's come across a shellfish trap a crab pot and if you can see that just on the right side at the end of where his light beam is going this is old it's not active that's not in use at all anymore but it's still got plastic net on it it still has the potential to catch animals in it so what he's going to do he's going to draw a picture of it he's going to write down any trapped animals in it he's going to basically try and evaluate how heavy it is how difficult it is going to be to be to remove and whether it's actually something simple like a shellfish trap like that or something much more complicated like a big net this survey helps us really make a plan for the second part of the project which is to remove it now you can see it's quite funny to try and write things underwater we've got special underwater notepads so it's like a plasticky kind of paper and we use plastic pencils so you can write just like you normally write on the surface now you'll notice that it's kind of scruffy the pictures i don't know why it is but as soon as you get underwater you can't write sensibly you can't draw pictures that look like anything sensible at all. So this is what happens when you draw underwater. I remember if I'd handed that in back at school and the years when I was at school, my teacher would have would have not been pleased with my handwriting or the, the quality of the diagrams. But underwater, everything's a bit a bit more difficult to work with. So you can see what what's been written in this survey here. So on the right hand side, what you can see is a survey of that crab pot or that lobster pot that we saw in the previous picture and we've got an estimate of how big it is 75 centimeters to one meter so that's approximately three feet long and really heavy <laughs> now this is kind of loose information but it does help us build a picture when we send the team in on the next day to go and pick it up now we've got a on the left hand side we've got a, a kind of a sketch of some fishing net and it's it's stuck onto the bottom probably tangled up in a, a piece of a shipwreck or in a, a rock on a reef they reckon it's quite small there's no fish caught in it so we've even though it's a scruffy looking diagram once we get back to the surface we can write all that down and we can turn it into something a bit more useful but we've got the information there that helps us make a plan for going and recovering this stuff on the next day now, another thing we always do on the survey dive is to take photographs and video of everything that we find, because you quite often don't manage to write everything down. Um, you forget things, you don't write, you, you draw something and it's really not quite right. So a really useful thing that we do is we bring cameras in and you can see that's me actually jumping in. Um, in that diver's hand, in my hand is a, is a great big underwater camera, which is a regular camera that goes into a waterproof box. And there's some lights on there as well. And we video everything that, that we're going to survey as well. So again, a combination of written notes and video, video shots of the, of the fishing gear that we want to recover always comes back on our survey dives. And this goes into building our plan for recovering things. And then the hard work starts. So once we've got our survey and once the team have built a plan, we get back into the water and we start dealing with all this fishing net and the ropes and all the other things that are kind of tangled into it. If we find live animals in the nets, and we often do, we'll always try and release them. We we'll always try and cut them free in the water if possible. And this is a diver called Fred, who's our operations manager. And he is on a wreck called the Scylla. 
which is near Plymouth on the south coast in uh, this is in Cornwall. And you can see just behind Fred there, you can see the old propeller shaft just sticking out of the sand there with the support that will go up above Fred's head is the is the bottom of the hull of the ship. So he's underneath the, the hull of the ship and he's found this great big ball of fishing net and rope. And what he's starting to do is to cut animals free and also to try and release it from from the ship itself in order that we can get it back to the surface. And then what we do is we attach these these bags to the gear. So what these are all empty when we take them down. We take them down, we attach them to the fishing net and then we inflate them with air. And that makes them very, very buoyant. So they then float to the surface. So we lift everything up. They're called lifting bags and we lift everything back up to the surface using the lifting bags. Now, quite often these nets get stuck on the bottom as well. So we get the lifting bag onto one end of the net and then we lift it up and then it stops because it's stuck on the net. So what we have to then do is to get our big heavy knives out and start almost giving the wreck a haircut, if you like. You try and cut as close as you can to the ship or the rocks or the reef or whatever to try and get as much of that fishing net up towards the surface as we can. And basically, because you're kind of interfering with the bottom a little bit here and you're moving things around all the silt and the dirt and everything that's that's been there for however long starts to get kicked up so you can see the diver here on the right hand side is starting to disappear into a into a cloud of, of silt and you can see the problem just gets worse and worse and worse the more you work the harder you work the more you cut the more you move the net around the, the kind of dirtier and messier this work gets so We've got combinations here of all kinds of things that are not what normal scuba divers do. Most scuba divers go into the water to see to see fish, to see shipwrecks, to enjoy kind of a very beautiful visual environment. But we're deliberately going into a place where there's fishing nets and most divers avoid fishing nets because they can catch you and tangle you up. We then we then mess around with them and try and get them lifting up towards the surface, which destroys the visibility. And then we cut them free with big sharp knives and the danger of that is firstly you can cut yourself um, quite badly with these knives and secondly you get dragged up to the surface with the fishing net if you get tangled up in it so there's a whole lot of problems that are not just simply go and pick up the net it's hard physical work it's not a particularly sensible thing to do it's not a safe thing to do but we have some really good strategies some ways of keeping everybody safe so for example in this picture, you can see there's actually three people in this picture. The third pic, the third person is actually holding the camera. So we have the diver right in front of you that is, is cutting the net free. There's already a lifting bag attached to that, which is dragging it upwards. There's the photographer. And then there's the third person, which you can just see behind. And what the third person is doing is basically making sure that the person cutting is not entangled in the net. And secondly, the photographer is also not entangled in the net. So it's very much a teamwork approach. We have one person cutting the net free. A second person, which can be shooting pictures as well, is watching that the person cutting doesn't get tangled in anything. And then we have the third person that looks over the whole show to make sure that the whole team is safe before that fishing net flies up towards the surface. So that's just another view. There's some there's some rope being cut up there and I think that's going to get stuck into that purple bag on the left hand side there. So that's another way we deal with stuff. If it's small stuff, we just chop it up and put it in a bag and bring that back up with us. But the big stuff is always lifted up with lifting bags. Sometimes it's one lifting bag and in the case of a big trawling net like this, it's going to take lots and lots of lifting bags to get it to the surface because it's just so heavy. I mean, this was a big lift we did. We had there's five five bags on that one and, and they're all full um so there's not much more capacity there before that ended up going up to the surface but when they do go to the surface um it's it's a it's a wonderful feeling to know that that piece of fishing net is on its way to the surface and that piece of fishing net won't catch any more fish and it won't do any more damage and it won't become microplastics in a in 100 years or so so the, the feeling we get when we start to to lift stuff to the surface is is it's just elation it's we're so happy that that stuff is now out of the environment and you know it's a great feeling to watch something like that head up towards the surface 
we can get back onto the surface and we start organizing all the stuff that we've got. The, the job isn't over once it's back onto the surface. We have to get all the fishing gear. So all these are uh, shellfish traps. There's nets and ropes and all kinds of stuff in there. They have to be got onto the boat, got onto the harbor, and then we have to decide what to do with them. Now, if the, if, if the net or the fishing gear, the traps are any good, we, we, we quite often give them back to the fishermen. I mean, if they can use them again, then why not? If not, we have to start to think about what we're going to do with that stuff. Now, recycling is our favorite option. Now, we have a couple of different opportunities with recycling. We've used this chap called Afraid Not. It's called Mark Cook, and he lives up in Orkney in the, in the north of the UK islands, the Orkney Islands, just off of Scotland. And he takes all of the rope and he washes it and cleans it and makes these beautiful knotted um, doormats and all kinds of other knotted um, ornaments, really. And they're beautiful things. And we gave him something like 10 kilometers. So that's about seven miles of of rope one year and he's used all of it to make into into these doormats and door stops and all sorts of stuff so it's a really it's a really good use of, of rope that we get now but it you know there's more to fishing gear than just rope so we've got a really exciting new project that i'm i'm delighted to tell you about i don't think i've told many people about this project yet so you're one of the first to hear about it it's it was developed by a guy called ali mitchell who's developed this this technique and he's set up a company called Ocean Plastic Pots. And Ocean Plastic Pots have, they've got awards from the government. They've, they've won prizes at something called the Chelsea Flower Show, which is a huge, very, very British institution, the Chelsea Flower Show. Every year, um, it's a huge exhibition of flowers and plants and all kinds of gardening things. Very, very British. Um, but he, he was down there exhibiting at the Chelsea Flower Show. And these plant pots that he makes um, won won lots of awards and he he now can't make enough pots to satisfy the demand which is great but they're all made from recovered fishing gear um, be that ropes be it fishing net anything plastic that comes out of the sea he's found a way of turning into these quite beautiful um, uh, plant pots now so it, we've just kind of agreed with Ali who's actually a diver and he's a diver on our team as well so there's a real nice connection there and he's agreed now to take basically any gear that we recover. He's going to take it and turn it into his into his uh, plant pots. So for me, this is really closing the circle. We can we can find lost fishing gear. We can survey it. We can count how many animals are lost in it. Um, we can we can recover it back to the surface. We can give it back to the fishermen if they want it. And the final step is to have it recycled if it's of no use to anybody and it gets turned into something beautiful and useful like an ocean plastic pot or a doormat. So really, that's, to, to use a joke, a potted history and a potted plan of what Ghost Fishing UK is all about. So I'm going to unshare my screen now. Unfortunately, you have to look at me now. So all right, go. Richard. So that was great. Thanks so much for the, the presentation, the great imagery that went along with it. And, you know, the, the, the great story as well, that not only uh, are you removing the gear, but then finding a place for it, a home for it, if you will, whether it's back with a fisherman uh, or recycling it and into other products. So it's, you know, it doesn't fill landfill. So just an amazing project start to finish. And as a diver myself, I know all the complications and how well trained everybody has to be. Uh, to stay safe in, in those conditions. Yeah, thanks, Joe. I mean, <laughs> it, I think it, the success of this project is because of the the dedication and the skill of the divers that we have on the team. Those 62 divers are just amazing. Some of the best divers I've ever, ever come across. And I've, you know, I've been diving 30 years, so I've seen a lot of divers. So just the fact that they give up their weekends for free, they they go and engage in this stuff that not many divers want to get involved with. It's, it's dangerous, dirty work at the end of the day. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's the team that make this work. All right. Well, we're going to get into Q and A in just a moment, but I do have a quick Kahoot quiz uh, that I pulled together in the background for our classrooms that are tuning in. So uh, if you head to Kahoot.it, it's going to ask you for a pin number. I'm going to share uh, my screen momentarily and you'll have that pin number. If you have one-to-one -one tech with you in your classroom, then of course you can join at your seats. Uh, if not, maybe your teacher can join at the front and you can shout out your answers to him or her. So let's get that screen share going and then let's jump into our Kahoot for today. 
All right, so today's pin number is 1100268, or you can scan it if you happen to have a mobile device up there with the QR code. We'll give a few moments for some students to join. I see a few joining already, uh, and then we will go live and we'll see how we do. So there'll be four questions today, two true and false, two multiple choice, uh, 20 seconds on the clock. If you get the answer right, you're getting some points. If you get it right quickly, you're getting even more points. If you get it wrong and really fast, well, still getting a big zero. So let's see how we do. We'll give another second, push over 50 students. That's great. We've got some eco warriors here. That's pretty cool. All right, students jumping in are slowing down just a little bit. Uh, so let's take things live and see how we do. All right, first question coming up. True or false? Shipwrecks are not good environments for marine life. Was that true or was that false? Shipwrecks aren't good environments for marine life. Couple more seconds. All right, we had a false there and that is the right answer. We tricked people a little bit. So yes, there's things like ghost gear that can be uh, dangerous when it's snagged on the shipwrecks, but on a whole shipwrecks can become amazing environments. Uh, artificial coral reefs, hiding spots, uh, great environments for, for fish. They can become nurseries and things like that as well. So on a whole, I think they do make good uh, environments for marine life. In top spot at the moment, Eco Warrior Eevee is in the lead, but anything can change. So let's jump to our next question. It's another true and false. Most fishing gear is lost by accident. Is that true uh, or is that false? All right, the vast majority went with true. Good job, crew. And Richard, I think you'd agree, uh, especially UK waters. Uh, you know, it's tough. It can be tough weather, tough waters. You don't want to lose that gear too. It's, it's Fishing gear is expensive. So uh, a lot of it is lost uh, by accident. I mean, it, it's at the end of the day, it's it's how people earn their living. Absolutely. So people are not going to throw it away indiscriminately. It, it, then it, if you start with the position that it's an accident, then the discussions but get a lot easier yeah okay let's jump to our next question let's see our leaderboard ethan's has taken the lead but let's see what happens with question three jumping into our true and false action what happens to fishing gear as it breaks down does it remain unchanged does it produce microplastics that enter the food chain does it catch even more marine life or does it completely break down All right, so as Richard said, a lot of fishing gear is made of plastic. It does break down into smaller plastics and then those can enter the food chain. And we're doing a lot of research right now uh, to figure out what kind of impact that has as it accumulates in higher levels of the food chain. And then of course, we're eating those plastics as well eventually. Mike, Mike has taken the lead. Final question, anything can happen, here we go. What is a complication of diving to recover ghost gear? Was it getting tangled in the gear? Is it reduced visibility? Is it the use of sharp tools? Or is all of the above uh, make complications while diving to recover the gear? All right. We tricked a few with the first one, which is absolutely correct. But all of the above are uh risks and we know there's a few others mixed in there as well so a very technical diving and uh you definitely have to be well trained to be able to to do it safely and of course i think you'd agree with this richard diving with buddies diving with teams is the safest way to go absolutely absolutely so third place was eco warrior and leo took down that second spot and mike was able to hold on from question three uh and take away the big win today
Good oh, stuff. Mike. Thanks for playing along with us. Uh, let's kill that screen share and let's uh, switch gears and go to a little Q&A action. So we've got classrooms joining us from Canada and the US today. We've also got classrooms tuning in live via YouTube. If you're on YouTube, send us in your questions uh, via the chat. In fact, I've got one right here from a grade six class. And Rich, they're wondering, what's the deepest dive that you've been on? <laughs> For ghost fishing or in general? Let's do both. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, so my deepest dive that wasn't a ghost fishing dive was 135 meters, I think. Wow. So I, over 300 feet, yeah. It's over 300, yeah. It's a long way over 300. It's more nearer 450, I think. Um, for ghost fishing, uh, we I think the deepest we've worked at is 50 meters. So that's like 170 feet. Now, we can go deeper. We have the team has the skill and the capability to go deeper. But the deeper you go on a dive, the more, the more, th more equipment you have to carry, the more problematic the more risks are involved with it and there is so much fishing gear in shallow water that we we don't see the need until we've got the once we've got all the stuff out the shallow water which is a lifelong job then yeah. we start looking at some of the deeper projects i mean we do do the odd deeper one every year but most of it is 100 feet or shallower okay all right well let's start visiting some camera classrooms we have a classroom joining us uh, in Toronto, room 114. Let's bring them live into the call. How are we doing today, Toronto? Hi, Toronto. Hello, good morning. Everyone say good morning. Good We're morning. so excited. Good morning. Our question was, what year did you start ghost fishing? So the Ghost Fishing UK project started in 2015. Um, up in the Orkney Islands in Scotland. But I I did my first ghost fishing project in a country called Croatia. Um, and basically I was working there and I had a, a week off as a, a break. And there was a, a team recovering some fishing net from one of the wrecks that I used for my classes. And they said, do you want to help us clean it? And I said, I'd love to because it would be a fun thing to do and a good thing to do. And I came out from that project and I just thought I have to bring this back to the UK because there's so much we could do. There's so much work to be done in the UK. So 2014, 2015 was when it really started in the UK. All right. Room 114, we'll try and come back your way shortly. See if there's a follow up. Let's jump to another camera classroom here. Let's go to Louisiana this time. We have some high schoolers hanging out with Mr. Dupuy. Let's bring them into the call. Uh, there they are. Oh, hey, Louisiana, how are you? Hey, Louisiana. Uh, we're the um, Eco Warriors, and our question is: um, Y'all were saying that like um, ghost ghost diving can be dangerous. So, what is the most dangerous experience y'all have uh, y'all have had while while saving the environment? Oh, everybody wants to know about the the dangerous bits. <laughs> I think. The, the most the most difficult thing really is getting the team to work together okay once you can get the team to work together then you can make things a lot safer so I'm gonna I'm gonna answer your question in two parts really I don't want accidents I want I don't want dangerous things that my biggest fear is one of my 62 divers getting hurt and that to me just can't happen like I will do everything I can to stop that happening. So we spend a lot of time training. We spend a lot of time working on the, the, the way that the team works together in this dangerous environment. Now, but sometimes we do have kind of incidents, if you like. And one of the one of the biggest risks we have and the one that's very difficult to control is is when you start to work hard underwater. Now, when you start to work hard underwater, things happen that don't happen on the surface now we can start you can start thinking about this a little bit uh, if you go for a run and work hard on the surface you start to breathe more okay now when you're underwater you've got a limited amount of breathing gas so if you're working hard you will move through that breathing gas you will use it much quicker than you would be normally so that's one aspect to working hard which means you can run out of gas quickly much quicker than you normally would. Now, there's a second thing, 
that happens when you work hard underwater. Now, I don't know how much you know about how the body works, but when you, if you hold your breath, after a while, your body will tell you you have to breathe. Now, that, that signal comes from carbon dioxide in your body. And underwater, that carbon dioxide is much more difficult to remove from your body because of the pressure of the water around you, basically. So what happens is you start to work hard, you make carbon dioxide, and it tells you you have to breathe. And you can't breathe it out because of the pressure of the water. And it very a very quick result of that is you can panic. And I've seen people come very, very close to panic and actually their eyes go big and they get absolutely terrified. They run through all their, they use all their gas really quickly. And it, and if you don't stop it happening, it can lead to some really quite serious problems. So the answer you might have been expecting was people getting tangled up in fishing nets and having to cut them free and all that kind of thing. Because of the procedures we use, that tends not to happen. But people do work hard and they do kind of go through their gas much quicker than they should and end up sometimes in this kind of panicked uh, situation. And panicked underwater is never pleasant. So I guess that's a, a, a long winded answer to your question. I hope that was all right. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, you know, as a diver myself, I've never done the removing of gear like you have, but even on a dive, you know, somewhere like Mexico, people can panic, especially absolutely. if they're, you know, in, in a dive that might be a little bit deeper than they're used to. So you definitely see it happen. Uh, okay, we're going to go to Mr. Patrick's crew joining us in London, Ontario. Let's bring them in. There they are. How's it going, London? Hey, London. Good afternoon. <laughs> um how old are some of the fishing nets that you untangle wow that's a really good question and an extremely difficult question because we we looked into trying to work out how old some of this fishing gear was when we first started the project and we spoke to um, biologists and fishermen and all kinds of people and the biologist said it's extremely difficult to put an age on it. You'd think that the amount of things that grew on it or the condition that it was in would tell you something about the age of the fishing gear, but it doesn't. Sometimes fishing gear can look like it's been down there a hundred years, but so much stuff has grown on it. But then you think, oh, that must be a very old piece of net, but actually things can grow and they can tangle up very, very quickly my so i actually can't answer the question it's it's extremely difficult the only way you could start to answer it would be to look at the type of plastic that was used in the making of the of the fishing gear and see when that stuff started to be made now probably 70 80 years ago most before plastics were as as uh, prevalent as they are now most of the gear was like an organic rope kind of fabric material and that will degrade and disappear quite quite safely. So you're probably looking at nothing older than, let's be conservative, 70 years. You're muted, Joe. There we go. Great question. And I know uh, it's interesting too, a lot of shipwrecks are found sometimes by talking to fishermen because they oh. snag their gear, they lose their gear in certain spots. Uh, and then I know you know, people can use that as kind of a jumping off point to find wrecks too. Mm. All right. We're going to take a little trip now. Where are we going? We're going to go to Ottawa. We've got some great sevens with Miss Nedco. Let's bring them into the conversation. Thanks. Hi, Lucy. Hey, Ottawa. How are we doing? Good. How are you guys? Good. Say hi. Hi, everyone. Hi. Kylie, what's your question? How big is the biggest fishing net that you've... The biggest one? I... I wasn't on this project. Um, they did it last year, my team. And I think it was something like three tons when they got it back to the surface. How uh, many lift bags would it take to get something like that to the surface? That's a lot of weight. Every single one we had, I believe. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think I... It's, a, it, it's not as simple as three tons of lifting bags because once it's in the water it floats a little bit once you get it on yeah. land it was three tons so it was probably in the water probably something like uh, a quarter of that weight mm -hmm. 
but once it's on the land it obviously gets heavier but yeah what it was weighed it was like a three ton three ton net all but right we've got to head to bracebridge now miss fourth size class is hanging out with us let's bring them in hey bracebridge hi can you hear us we got gotcha. you okay. yeah. Um, we're just wondering about your like physical training and even like mental training for for like when you're not diving and kind of like to to get yourself out of those panic uh, moments. Well, <laughs> everybody everybody's different, and we all deal with it in our own personal ways. I like to run and ride bicycles. Um, some of them don't do anything at all and they rely on just not getting into a panic situation. Avoidance is always the trick, but I always find that I've always found in the 30 years I've been diving, just, just being reasonably fit through running and, and cycling and just being cardiovascularly fit makes a huge difference. The, I don't do much strength work, but then I lift cylinders and tanks and weights and everything around all day anyway. Um, so my, my fitness is mostly cardiovascular. Good question. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, I think training is important too. I think a lot of divers, they do like a weekend course and then mm. you know, often diving. I think you should always be training, learning new skills, practicing those skills out in the real world, world environment. Uh, yeah. And I know that none of those 62 divers, you know, they, they'd be out there if, if you weren't confident that they were, were ready to go and yeah. Those 62 divers have all done a three-day training course with us. So they have to be experienced divers already. Uh, they have to then take a three-day class with us. And then before we release them into the team, they have to do like a supervised project with us. So they have to come out with one of our kind of instructors and they have to, they have to show a good attitude and a safe yeah. kind of work in practice. And then, then they can be full-on divers. All right. So Miss P's class is joining us via YouTube and they've got a question here. So uh, this has happened to me before on Rex, especially with poor visibility. Sometimes you lose your partner or you get separated. So what's your procedure if uh, some of the team gets separated on a wreck? Okay. So that's a really good question. Um, so it, it starts again, way before the actual event of becoming lost. So most of us, we all use bright lights. And we always use the bright lights as a, it, yes, they're useful for seeing things and looking at stuff, but they're also really good communication tools. So that's the first thing, bright lights and also paying attention, you know, look at where your, where your teammates are. We typically dive in three person teams. So actually that's like one extra person you have to, to keep track of. And again, we make a plan for what we're going to do on the dive. So we're going to go down the, the line to the wreck and then we're going to swim in a certain direction to a certain place. So if everybody has agreed to that, there shouldn't really be a separation because we're all heading in the same direction anyway. But if it does happen, our strategy is to stop, take a, take a look, a 360 degree look around you, see if you can see those bright lights, see if you've perhaps got lost off of the pathway that you should have been on. And what I tend to do then is go back to the place where I last saw that person. And if I can't find them, then I'll kind of reevaluate how much time I've got. Um, because, because of the work we're doing, if they've got caught in a fishing net or a line or something like that, I don't want to just go back to the surface. You need to, to kind of work out where they've gone. So we start to, to look at more systematic search process. To be honest, taking a 360 degree look round, looking for the lights and then backtrack into where you last last saw them, that works just about every time. So it's all about paying attention from the start really. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, I know I can see in the chat, there's, there's a few more questions. We're gonna try and, and lightning through a few more of our camera classrooms again and give them a second opportunity. So uh, Ms. Nedko, let's start with your crew. Yep. One second, Ava, stay there. Here we go. What's your question, honey? Um, what's the most unique sea, sea creature you saw while um while close fishing? The most unique sea creature. Oh, oh. The most unique. That's a really difficult question. Um 
I think the most exciting one I saw was a minke whale. Um, I was just kind of ascending up the line from the wreck and this huge whale swam past me. It's not unusual to find seals. Uh, seals will frequently come and play. They love to play seals and they will quite often come in and play with the boys that were on fishing gear. Um, they'll come and see what you're doing. They're very inquisitive animals. So seals are not unusual to see. Um, but yeah, the, we don't, if we do have rare species in the UK, I, I'm not very good at identifying them. <laughs> so I, that's the best I can do. That works. Minky whales are pretty cool. Uh, if you have some time later today, look them up. Kind of a smaller whale species, but they're, I mean, they're it's big. Not small. They're so big. They're cool. swimming right next to you. It's not small. Yeah. <laughs> I can imagine there was a moment where you were like, what is that dark, big that thing? Dark shadow. <laughs> yeah. Very cool. Uh, let's swing back to Mr. Patrick's crew. Um, I was wondering if there was an estimate of the volume of nets lost in the oceans worldwide. There is. That's an excellent question. So the United Nations have published an estimate of, it's not a volume, it's a weight. And they, they estimate, and it's a reasonably good estimate, that 640,000 tons of fishing gear get lost in the oceans around the world every year. Now, that's a really difficult thing to visualize. I, I've tried multiple times and I can't do it. Um, have any, if any of you have ever been to London, uh, we have a, a, a subway network in London and you can probably imagine the size of it. It goes across a you know, 20 kilometer, 20 mile diameter city and it has networks all over it. You could fill the London Underground Network two times every year with the amount of fishing gear that gets lost. All that? Right. that is a massive amount of fishing gear uh and that's year on year so year on year. Yeah. yeah wow all right uh let's get back to our crew in toronto do you guys have a follow-up we do levi ask your question quick 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 how like what is the hardest expedition you've ever gone on? did you hear that what is the hardest expedition you've ever gone on uh, i think they get hard, the, the, the projects get hard when they get deep. Um, and there's a there's a depth at around 110 feet, 32, 33 meters, where basically the amount of time you can spend on the bottom is something like 20 minutes. So it's not so much that it's physically difficult, but you have to be really, really efficient with your 20, 25 minutes of bottom time. So you have to get to the place where the fishing net is. You have to set the, the lifting bags up. You have to start cutting and you have to get everything done and finished within a very tiny window. So let's let's say you've got 25 minutes. It normally takes five minutes to get down to the to the seabed and to the wreck. So your 25 minutes is now 20. It will probably take you two or three minutes to get to where the fishing net is. So now you're down to 15 minutes of work. So basically just to attach the lifting bags and start cutting, you've got 10 to 15 minutes of work time. And that that's to me when it gets hard, because if the teamwork isn't working properly, you're not efficient with the, the way that you're working in the water. That's when things not go wrong, but that you don't get the results that you want to get. If you're diving in shallow water, like 15, 20 meters, so 70 feet, then, then you have something like an hour of time that you can, that you can use. So think, things get more difficult the deeper you go, basically. All right, and we'll take one more final question. We'll check in with our Bracebridge crew, see if they have a, a wrap up for us. Um, sorry if we missed the answer to this earlier, but how do you get funding for your equipment and your oxygen and stuff? Well, that's, that's a, a good question. So initially, when we first started the project, we funded everything ourselves pretty much. Um, so all came out of our personal personal funds. Um, over the years, we've started to get some fantastic donations from the general public. So we have, and you can go to our website and you can make a donation there. I'm not asking you to, I'm just saying that's, that's how we do it. Um, but then every year we run a few kind of high level campaigns and we can get things called fund matching. So we find companies that 
like the work that we do. So Ali at Ocean Plastic Pots, he he basically says you can have a thousand pounds, for example, uh, but we only get that money if we then raise another thousand pounds from the public. So we can do fund matching uh, projects. And so basically there's a steady stream of donations from the public every year. And then once or twice a year, we run a big kind of push to to capture enough funding to run for the for the following year. Sometimes we have been successful in getting grants and things like that, but the, at the moment, that's how we're doing it. All right. Well, I want to start off. I want to share the website here and let me pop up this banner. So if you do want to visit and learn a little bit more, uh, we've got ghostfishing.co.uk. And you can learn a little bit more about the team and 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 the work that they're doing. There's some great imagery uh, on the site as well. Uh, classrooms, classrooms on YouTube, classrooms in camera spots. Thank you so much for joining us. Let's pop a few of you guys in. So if you want to give a little wave, thanks guys. It's good to see you today. Thanks for joining us. There they are. Very cool. Back one wave. <laughs> All right, and Richard, always a pleasure. Uh, to steal you for a bit, to share your work with students, uh, hopefully some future divers, some future conservation divers out there with us today. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, good luck getting back out and, and removing more waste. I, like you said, it's, it's, a, it's a job that's not going to end anytime soon. That's so right. So thank, thank Joe. That's brilliant. Thanks to everyone for the really good questions. There were some excellent questions there. Really well done. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a great weekend. Uh, and hopefully we see your crews joining us again in February. Have a great weekend. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.